politics and what has been also going on in, in Ukraine since 2014, since the Maidan, um, and also the war um, in the Donbass. And I've been working about it academically, um, as well as uh, from a sort of journalistic uh, perspective in terms of writing, but also in terms of actually uh, talking a lot about Ukraine on, on television and, and other media forms, um, and also um, delivering aid in, in, in the Donbass. However, I still have also the hat of, of an academic, and, um, and I would like to talk a little bit actually about sort of this sort of bias and then this sort of media um, discourse when we talk about Ukraine. Um, now, you're obviously the, the most well-informed uh, audience I could possibly have to talk about uh, Ukraine. Um, I could also share with you that uh, it would be not uncommon um, if I go to Ukraine that beforehand maybe friends or even academic friends would ask me, the war in Ukraine has finished, hasn't it? And I would say, no, it hasn't finished. And it is in, in many ways still, also if you look at sort of the media and also the political discourse, it's like a Niesvjestnaya Vaina. It's like an unknown war um, to many. And, uh, and obviously we can ask questions. Why could that possibly be that actually there's very little room given um, to the uh, war in Ukraine or the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine? Obviously, there is some room given very often maybe to the uh, civil war in, the, in Ukraine or maybe there's something about the internal conflict uh, in, in Ukraine. So let me just talk a little bit about um, some, of this, um, some of this bias. Now, obviously, as you know, you teach media, you teach journalism. Um, you know, the, you've got a huge responsibility. Not only do we have fundamental challenges, as was just sort of said, but you also have huge responsibilities because obviously, you have got the stake, or, we've, or the media has got the stake, um, in terms of sort of the power games that are being played at the international, at the national level. And obviously, journalists as well as mass media have a hugely important um, gate, gatekeeper function. Um, and obviously, when we talk about sort of bias, and obviously when we look at sort of media corporations, um, media outlets, then bias is sort of filtered through to two types really, it's sort of selection bias and, and description bias. It's obviously filtered through other methods um, as well, um, but I would just like to pick up sort of um, um, these two and also talk about how they play out in practice. Now obviously for a media outlet or for a newspaper, it always depends on what small number of events or problems from a much larger pool of events is going to be chosen. If um, I just did, or well, I'm in the process of, of, of writing a report about how the British media reports about the war in Ukraine. Um, and I, I did a sort of content analysis of um, two big newspapers and also the BBC um, website. And um, the results are very disappointing in many ways. So there's a lot of sort of selection bias um, happening. We also have a lot of description bias. So of how events are being portrayed. Um, I know some of you were in the, on the Maidan, whether it was in Kiev or I don't know whether it was in, in Kharkiv or elsewhere. Um, if you look at the press at the time, there seemed to be sort of two big themes about Ukraine. One was almost this sort of um, perspective sort of building up as if there's some conflict between um, the EU and Russia over Ukraine, where actually Ukraine is almost not, not a real actor, but it's almost sort of between a rock and a hard place, between two geopolitical blocks. And the other theme, if we go sort of towards maybe sort of February, March, obviously Maidan ended, got the occupation of in, in end of uh, February, got the occupation of Crimea, but the discourse then changed. You know, it was almost as if we've got sort of marauding right-wing Nazi groups uh, in, in Kiev um, and elsewhere. And the, the content in terms of the description bias became very sort of evident. Um, and, so, and we can really see this sort of play out very nicely in the, um, in the Western media. And it seems almost this kind of description bias then also in terms of the reporting about the war uh, in Western newspapers led to a certain perspective where we always have to be 
doubtful about Ukraine. We can never really fully trust Ukraine. We talk about corruption. We talk about oligarchs. Uh, we talk about how much parliamentarians earn. We talk about scuffles in parliament. Um, we talk about how the war and, and the military in, in, uh, in the Donbass is, is not properly supported or financed or equipped in terms of technical equipment. Um, and I could, I could tell you a lot of stories about that. Um, last year, in, when it was about um, martial law in Ukraine, uh, and I was on BBC World Service and also on, on, on BBC News, on Five Live, uh, BBC London, and they were interested in sort of the martial law. And you have to remember, this is the moment when we actually have like a creeping annexation of the Sea of Azov, where actually the main topic should be Kerch Bridge, Sea of Azov, creeping annexation, um, the throttling economically of uh, Mariupol. But actually, and I think, yes, I'll be, I'm asked to talk about it, but really the first question I, I would get is, is Poroshenko just using martial law uh, for his re-election? Is the conflict in Sea of Azov manufactured by Ukraine? And, and you can already see how the description bias is working. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking really just about the Sea of Azov, trying to understand actually Kerch bridges against international maritime law to have the bridge. It is against international maritime law to also have such a low bridge where the Panamax containers cannot go to Mariupol. But we talk about something else, and that is exactly this kind of description bias that's working to the disadvantage of, um, of, of Ukraine. And what this happens, this sort of selection bias and description bias that we have in, in regard, particularly also to Ukraine, it combines sort of into a process that, you know, God bless sort of Chomsky, what would we do if we didn't have him, into sort of the manufacturing of, of consent. So of meaning sort of the dissent between conflict parties is, is marginalized in the interest of social political elites. Or maybe this conflict, this dissent, is actually marginalized in the interest also of, and let's call the elephant in the room, and also in the interest of Russia, the geopolitical interests of, um, of Russia. And what happens, this kind of bias in the media then easily diffuses into other political um, and expert discourses. And, um, and this also plays out, I'm, or have been part, because I used to work on Russia. I'm a Russianist, that's what I would have been sort of called, uh, you know, before 2014. Um, and I'm, I've been part of this sort of academic group. I've been in the UK for 20 years. Um, I've been going to all the conferences of the, of sort of for Eastern European uh, and, and Russian studies. But you can see also how this also really framed this bias in the ways of the, ex the expert discourses or the academic discourses. In 2015, try to find 10 British academics who would be very critical of Russia's actions and who would be quite vociferous about it, maybe um, in, terms of, in terms of the media, in terms of their own writing. You would actually struggle. And it's exactly how uh, uh, this sort of descriptive, um, uh, sorry, sort of the description bias um, has, has, um, has worked here as well. So, and obviously this bias leads to kind of framing. And the war in Ukraine, or the war between Russia and Ukraine, um, has been framed in a certain way. So we are selecting and highlighting certain pieces of information about sort of the reality. We create a reality. Um, two years ago, I gave uh, a report in the British Parliament. There were two meetings one with British, British parliamentarians and members of the House of Lords, and one public meeting. And I was struggling for a long time before I had the meeting, before I did the report. Uh, it was written, but I also gave a daklad. Uh, I um, gave a presentation. I was wondering, how do I give the presentation? Because parliamentarians, they've heard it all. They get the data, they get the reports, they read endless things. It's probably death by PowerPoint uh, for some of them. 
Um, so what I try to do, I try to work with, with children's drawings, Ukrainian children's drawings of children that actually live in the war zone, that are some of the 750,000 children that live in the war zone in Ukraine. I also went in with artifacts to actually try to, in a way, get this sort of emotive connection with, with that parliamentarians could then have. You know, just like a little um, keychain with keys uh, from a school director from Krasnokhorovka, which is a small town right bang on the front line, outskirts of Donetsk, um, you know, who would tell me about how she would, as a child, would actually, you know, she would give money uh, in the Soviet Union, Kapiki, every sort of, sort of weekend to Africa. And, uh, and she gave me a keychain. I chose it also in the parliament because there were keys for her apartment, um, for her school, for her car, for her dacha. Uh, and, but none of those existed any longer. They were all destroyed. Krasnohorovka had five schools. They're all now in a former, former hospital. So I try to bring sort of almost like this emotive element so that people can actually connect because the reality that we have largely through the media discourse about Ukraine is a very different one. We do not see or understand the humanitarian or the human suffering side of what is happening in Ukraine. And it has a lot to do with how the conflict, how the war is actually um, framed. It is framed in a, in a particular um, kind of way. And so sort of trying to break through that is actually very difficult. How many people would know that actually is one of the biggest refugee crises that we've had since World War II in Ukraine. 1.8 million internally displaced people. How many people in Britain would know about that? How many countries in Europe would be able to deal with 1.8 million? Maybe Germany could. Yeah, they took 1.2 million uh, in the one year in terms of refugees. But 1.8, that is a lot. That's a huge strain. But we don't really talk about that in the media. We talk about the questions that we always ask about um, Ukraine, and it's the framing that's really happening. Um, and what is actually happening is that we, we blind out unwanted insights um, and opinions, and that happens all the time. So for me, obviously, when I think about sort of journalism education, and I think you also spoke about the need today about, so for example, English language, I would love to see more Ukrainian journalists writing in English high quality articles about the reality of the war in Ukraine and actually what it means, the human misery also that is sort of attached to it. I would like to see actually really good quality war journalism. Um, in the summer I was in Vietnam, Vietnam was mentioned, I gave a talk about asymmetrical warfare, 60 years of asymmetrical warfare looking at Vietnam and the Ukraine. Um, and uh, I was just struck when I went through the museum uh, in Ho Chi Minh City, which was called about the, sort of the war crimes of the US and China, but it's, it's got, now it's a museum of, of war remnants, um, the quality also of journalism that we had during the Vietnam War, the kind of, you could say, maybe gonzo journalism as well, but the quality that we actually had, certain risks that were taken, but also actually trying to actually not just have some sort of embedded clinical view, but actually something sort of from, from, the, uh, from the ground up because that actually is a way for us to think about how we can actually bring out the unwanted insights and, and opinions. So this kind of framing that we have at the moment, it's very biased. And obviously the audience gets a very sort of biased perspective here and is extremely biased when it comes to, um, when it comes to Ukraine. And it goes often unnoticed by recipients, which is why coming back to my friends, my educated friends, much more educated than me, but they don't know about that the war is still going on in Ukraine. So um, anyone who comes to my place, they will know that the war is still going on because I've got like little sort of um, presents back from this sort of war zone. So I've got a little 120 millimeter uh, artillery piece sitting on my bookcase right in the corridor. And that's a piece from the 11th of November last year when everyone was commemorating World War I and everyone was very quiet and was commemorating and Putin and the rest, they were all there. And actually delivering aid in Nyavdevka, you had 120 millimeter artillery fire and heavy machine gun fire. That is the unwanted reality that is not being reported about it. Yeah? I tried to flog an article to, to the Guardian 
uh, about the sort of discrepancy between Armistice Day here in Europe, in this part of Europe, and Armistice Day out there on the other edge of Europe uh, in, in, in Ukraine. Because the media, the media, what it does, it, it obviously produces bias at will, and you know much more about it than, than I do, because you are the, the, the professionals. Um, but we have a problem that we have a particular sort of political ideological agenda that is sort of playing out and continues to, to, to play out. And it makes also, I think, sort of the implementation of a fourth estate, if we, if we think about sort of journalism as a fourth estate, um, really difficult. And for you also to, to exactly have this kind of responsibility. Um, and obviously what's happening here, it's a certain political project um, that is trying to be sort of uh, pushed on sort of an audience in terms of, um, in terms of the media. And also what's happening, we've got like a certain sort of social resources for strategies are, are being assembled. And we can see that sort of playing, playing out already. Um, a good example, two years ago, there was this sort of um, news that a, a Russian, Germ Russian child, a Russian German girl, was being raped by um, refugees. And there were demonstrations outside Angela Merkel's sort of office in, in, in Berlin. Sputnik was there. It was all over the news in Germany and, 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 and so particularly sort of more so sort of on the right, this kind of political media, but it was picked up also by the BBC and The Guardian. And actually it turned out to be total fake news. Yeah, the, the girl was actually with, with relatives. It's never been sexually uh, molested, assaulted. But what was interesting, who were the people that were demonstrating outside? Well, these were people that actually had been mobilized. These are the social resources. There were people from um, certain political groups in Germany, but also from certain sports groups, yeah, where you can learn a, a Russian method of self-defense, Systema. Um, we got them all over Germany. And funnily enough, just a few months later, 22 members of, uh, of a sports group, of Systema sports group, were arrested in Germany. And they said, ah, we're not just German citizens. We actually also have a Russian passport and uh, we also work for the, uh, for the GRU and for the um, FSB. And they were deported. But you can see how you can mobilize people. The whole idea, obviously, also of, in, in that sense, of Russia's um, sort of hybrid warfare strategy. You can destabilize a country within two weeks, how it is sort of playing out. But it's really this kind of framing the, the discourse. Um, and, and, and this is something, obviously, that we're we're dealing with, particularly obviously when we talk about Ukraine, because Ukraine is a test lab. Anything that happens here has happened before in Ukraine. Think about anything in terms of cyber information, um, disinformation, warfare. Um, it has happened before in, um, in Ukraine. And this is just some, some uh, quotes. I kind of like the, the Pomerantsev. I'm, don't agree really with his work very much, but I think it's, it, it's, it's got, he's got interesting points. He said, Russia has hybridized not only its actual warfare, but also its information warfare. Much of the epistemology democratic nations thought they had permanently retired after the Cold War needs to be relearned and adapted to even cleverer forms of propaganda and disinformation. So my Swedish colleague was just talking about new spots, so-called fake news. Well, Actually, the Russian secret services have developed a lot of instruments in, 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 and they have been employing them um, for, for many years. Um, and I liked how it was pointed out in several of the presentations today and, and also the day before, how actually there's a more and more of a distrust in classic news media. And obviously this distrust doesn't just happen accidentally, at the Nitoka Slutshiny. Um, because what we have here is the truth, the notion of truth is, is, has been really changing. Um, because what we now do is, you don't even have to try to prove the truth in terms of if we look at sort of information, warfare strategies, if we look at certain kinds of, sort of journalism that we have. Um, you can basically just say anything. You can create realities. And that obviously goes back 
to the responsibility that you all have, and that is obviously so imbued also in this, in this project. It's a, we share a huge responsibility in terms of actually not just developing, but actually really maintaining, protecting, safeguarding standards, professionalism uh, within journalism. And, and obviously, if we also look at our project, we can also learn so much from, um, from, from each other. Um, now, what is actually happening in, in, in many ways, obviously, what the Putin administration here is doing, if we look at it sort of more on, on from a from micro perspective, it's trying to exploit the idea of freedom of information. It's trying to inject disinformation into media discourses and societies. So what you do is you don't try to convince people, but you just tell different variations of the truth until people don't know what's the truth any longer. I was in Kiev when the Malaysian airliner was shot down. Some of you might remember what was on Russian so state television. There were lots of different explanations. One explanation of the time was, actually it was a plot by the CIA. It was actually, you remember the missing Malaysian airline, airliner? Yes. Russian state airliner, they said it was the missing Malaysian airliner. It was taken by the, by the FBI or CIA. They'd stacked it with fresh bodies and they crashed it over Ukraine in order to start World War III. And they said, where are the grieving relatives? Because there are no grieving relatives, they all have new passports. And I thought this is just so absurd. But that same summer, um, I was in Moldova and um, Transnistria as well. And I took the, the, the taxi from, from, the, from the airport into, um, uh, into the city when I, when I arrived in Moldova. And the taxi driver told me exactly that story, that that's what happened. And um, I had two bags in his boots, so I, 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 okay, I was just listening. I was just doing the, you know, participant observation kind of, sort of social scientist thing. But that's exactly, you proliferate falsehood. You tell so many different variations until nobody knows what's, what's the truth. And it's also increased, Russia's increasing its, its, uh, its, its so, so to speak, information warfare budget. We've got Sputnik, uh, we've got the Internet Research Agency, news spots, ads and social media. Troll factory, false social media profiles, the list goes on. And obviously I'm also worried about this sort of deep fake, and that's I think very interesting for David. You know, when you can have videos of people saying things and actually it looks like the real person said it, but actually it is, it is uh, a fake, fake video. Um, and what we also have, and that makes it so difficult, in the old days, the Cold War, well, it was easy. In Germany, you maybe had, I'm, I'm a German citizen, Technically, I think it's 20 years. I don't know, you're citizen of the Europe, really. Um, but, you know, you would have communist groups that would be supported. But what do we have now? We've got groups on the left, on the far right, environmental groups, um, that anti-globalist groups, financial elites. They all get some form of support also by Russia, and they play the role of the useful idiot. But what it does, it, it exacerbates division. It creates an echo so to speak, echo chamber of, of Kremlin um, support. It also explodes our liberal openness. And one thing I always like to say when I, when I talk to people that, you know, uh, you know tell me, I, you know, oh, you, you deal with, with those Nazis, are you Banderovtsi yourself? And I would say, no, actually, you know, when you do research in Ukraine, what's actually really nice, you have a lot of openness. Try to do some research, try to engage with people and organizations, try to engage with civil society actors, try to engage actually with, also with, with other sort of actors on, on the national level, and actually you'll find a lot of openness in, um, in, in, in Ukraine. But that can be exploited, and we see that sort of playing out. Um, there's also, and I spoke about my academic colleagues, there's the Valdai Forum. I've got colleagues that love to go to the Valdai Forums. They would love to go. Some of them actually do go, and they love the fact that they've been invited. And it's very interesting to, to see this, this, this kind of sort of process. Um, if you're asked to provide an opinion on Sputnik, I don't get asked, but I know colleagues that get asked. I also know what the current rate is in order to speak on Sputnik as a, as a Western expert. You know, five, 600 pounds. Depends, if you're the director of Chatham House, he has declined, by the way. It can go up to 1,000 pounds. 
for just giving an opinion on, uh, on, on RT or on, on Sputnik, you can see the temptation. Yeah? You can see the temptation. Um, so some of these expert community have been also co-opted, and that frames the disco discussion, and that also frames in the way the bias that we have in terms of the, the, how the war is being reported between Russia and, and Ukraine. We've got PR firms and influencers um, that help the Kremlin's cause by you know, arguing that finance and politics should be separate. Um, you know, there's Bertolt Brecht, the sort of great playwright who said, you know, um, Erstes Fressen, dann die Moral, which is basically, you know, first you eat, then it's about sort of morals. Um, but you can see how this sort of is, um, is, 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 is playing out. And what we also have is, it is a situation where the Putin administration tries to foster sort of anti-Western authoritarian, almost international. It's a new kind of sort of international. And it's, we see it becoming more popular in Central Europe, but also other parts of the world. And it really becomes more and more sort of a weaponization of, of information, of culture, of money. And, and that also makes it so difficult. And it also makes your job so incredibly difficult because that's what you're fighting against. I work for a charity called British Ukrainian Aid. Okay? I'm the only non-Ukrainian. But who do the journalists want to talk to when they want to talk to uh, British Ukrainian Aid? They would like to, ideally like to talk me, talk to me, because I'm not Ukrainian. I can be trusted more because the others are expats. Some of them actually have British passports, but they trust, them, trust me a little bit more because obviously I'm not Ukrainian. So obviously I would be less biased. So you can see exactly how this sort of narrative is, um, is, 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 is playing out. And in many ways what you are, you're frontline journalists. Yeah. You may be not working in Atto or Bushi Atto, but you're frontline journalists because you deal with all of these aspects every day. And you have to, within the regional, national, international level, depending on who your audience is, you have to, in a way, sort of deal with it and you have to try to reframe the discourse and also deal with the sort of weaponization of, um, of, of, of information. Um, just sort of two more things that I would like to say is um, that what Russia is doing, it's eroding investigative journalism. It also produces a lack of faith in traditional media, it plays a huge role. We also have academics. I've got a colleague called um, Karen Dawisha who wrote a, a book with the title of Putin's Kleptocracy. She had a contract with the university press, one of the university presses, um, but they after they got sort of letters, angry letters from, from the Kremlin's solicitors, they decided not to publish it. So she had to go for an American uh, university press that was, that was going to publish it. She's a super established uh, uh, colleague, uh, academic in the field. So she's not someone who's a propagandist or, um, or, or anything. And what we also have is this sort of blurring of, of distinctions. What is a think tank? What is a lobby group? Who is really a journalist and who is maybe um, actually some sort of consultant? And this blurring, and I think that's what also likely was picked up during the days, that actually we need to ensure the professionalism of those working in the field. We need to be able um, to, to find a way to actually professionalize further. And that doesn't go just for Ukraine. It goes for us, for all of us. So we're sitting in the same, in the same boat, basically. Um, so I'm just going to finish here, and I, I, I had some colleagues from Mariupol, and, uh, and obviously it's all about voice and, and talking about these things, but it was, a, it was a, one of my interviewees um, uh, from Shirokine. She was originally from Shirokine, which is a totally destroyed small town uh, near Mariupol, and she said, you know, I have no words left. I can only hope that others will speak with the voice of reason for me. And I think that is exactly what it's all about. And what's all about, I think, also from a journalistic point of view, and also we think about reframing, giving a voice to those that do not have a voice any longer or feel their voice has been um, quietened. So thank you very much. <laughs>